And if anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, uh, just for the duration of this session, uh, most of us are going to be off video, uh, including Shazad and myself, uh, unless we're having a specific conversation, uh, just to, to keep most of the focus on the slide. Um, thank you everyone for joining today. I'm Leslie Longstreet from the Cyber Readiness Institute, and I will be presenting today with my colleague uh, Shazad Mirza from uh, the Global Cyber Alliance. Uh, Shazad, if you would like to give a little bit of your background and a bit of background on GCA, that would be great. Sure. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Shazad Mirza. I am the Director of Operations at Global Cyber Alliance. Um, I've been doing cybersecurity now for, I think, 16 or 17 years. Um, too long <laughs> at this point. Um, but, uh, you know, I've, I've started my career with Symantec. I've worked with the Center for Internet Security for Ernst & Young, and now I'm here at Global Cyber Alliance. Um, and basically, Global Cyber Alliance is a not-for-profit organization, and our goal is basically to take a look at the various cybersecurity risks that are impacting everybody around the globe and see what areas and gaps there are that people need to really seriously take into account um, and to fill those uh, those gaps by some either by us developing something or us working with a partner to uh, build something to help fill those gaps. So that's what we do. Thank you, Shazad. Um, and I am the global director of outreach outreach and partnerships at the Cyber Readiness Institute, also known as CRI. Uh, a little bit of background about CRI is we were founded in uh, July of 2017 after a group of senior leaders convened to serve on the Commission on Enhancing National Security. And uh, they saw a need, uh, the, the people that were on that commission saw a need to follow up on some of the recommendations that they were providing to the US administration. Uh, and that those recommendations were to provide content that was free, accessible and prescriptive for small and medium sized businesses um, to secure their global value chains um, for larger companies. Uh, so CRI's purpose is basically to help provide uh, free accessible cybersecurity content for small and medium sized businesses. But everything that uh, CRI provides uh, can be applied to really any business because our main goal is creating a culture of cyber readiness. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand and I'll be happy to call on you uh, and get you to either turn your video on or just ask a question. Um, but I am going to turn my video off for now and uh, go over today's agenda. Um, so today we are going to cover uh, just an overview of cyber risks and um, what that means and what your business uh, will face uh, when it comes to these different cyber risks. Um, and then Shazad will cover the portion that is know what you have, um, which is uh, going to cover why having an inventory of all of your assets is absolutely critical. Uh, then I will finish up with uh, simple passwords or beyond simple passwords, uh, which is going to go into the importance of why passwords are so important and steps you can take to help your passwords be more uh, secure and more strong and uh, basically just create a system uh, where your passwords can work in your favor. So we can go to the next slide. All right, uh, so this is just uh, an overview of what we're going to cover in the cyber risk portion. What do we mean by cyber risk? The types of attackers, some statistics for small businesses, and how we can reduce cyber risk. What is cyber risk? Um, you hear this term quite often if you are uh, at all involved in cybersecurity or in IT. Um, and really what it comes down to is um, making sure that your company is um, able to um, move forward and have business continuity even with a cyber attack. So a cyber risk is um, the amount of risk that you have 
potentially to lose to a cyber attack. Um, and this risk can come from really any place. Um, anyone can find information about uh, how to, to get into your system. Um, people and hackers um, will find information about your company, your employees online. It's very simple with social media. And um, we'll get into this a little bit later, but uh, passwords play into that quite a bit and phishing. Um, so just understanding and knowing that there is risk out there and hackers are very good at what they do uh, is important to know. So we can go to the next slide. So I'll just give a quick overview on different types of attackers because you can have um, types of attackers that are anywhere from script kiddies, which are pretty much the kids sitting in the basement that um, people think about, uh, all the way up to nation states, uh, which are um, much more involved attacks. Um, I know that Georgia has uh, suffered some of these nation state attacks over uh, the past few years, uh, so I know that this is something that many of you are aware of. Um, but script kiddies are basically anyone that can use um, something that is out there on the internet to code or hack into your computers. Um, financially motivated attackers are looking for that next level. Um, they're not just doing it for fun and to cause havoc or to wreak havoc. Uh, they are looking for credit card data that they can sell again online health records that they can, again, sell and exploit, um, and other information that can be sold for a profit online. Um, hacktivists are um, really, they're not just the, the person that's looking to wreak havoc and cause issues or make a profit. They're generally motivated by something that is um, bigger than just themselves, whether it's political or social, um, and they are trying to go in and hack to, to make a statement, essentially. Um, and then nation states, as we all know, uh, are uh, their, their purposes are a little bit more long-term and strategic, um, and it's something that small businesses need to be aware of just because they are Small businesses and medium-sized businesses are a gateway to larger uh, businesses that these nation states could potentially be uh, looking to attack. Can we go to the next slide? Um, so as you all know, uh, we are still currently in a pandemic. Uh, COVID-19 has affected every single one of us uh, in, in some ways more than others, um, but I know at least um, most of you are um, now having to figure out how to work from home or work partially from home, uh, whether you were doing that before or not. Um, but this uh, causes quite a few additional risks, um, such as unpatched, unsecured devices, um, unable to access or being unable to access uh, your corporate network, which um, if you're just uh, on your home network, it may not be nearly as secure, or um, you may not have the um, security in place to uh, be able to reach back into your corporate network, whether that's through a VPN, um, and, and you're just opening yourself and your business up to a little bit more risk by having uh, more people access uh, email and whatnot through their private networks and devices. So just a small um, business snapshot here. 30% um, of data breaches in 2020 uh, involved small businesses, which if you think about it, that is a huge percentage. Um, a single cyber incident can cost up to $200,000. Um, and that is a huge hit to a lot of small and medium sized businesses. Um, some don't make that much, and, and this is in US dollars. Uh, some don't profit that much in a year. Uh, so if, if a cyber incident hits you with that, then the chances of you opening again or being able to recover from a cyber breach are, are quite narrow. 
So what can you do to reduce the cyber risk? You can have good cyber hygiene um, and CRI calls this good cyber hygiene, uh, creating a culture of cyber readiness. Um, they're, they're very similar and they go pretty hand in hand, um, but there are some uh, big boxes that you can check internally with your organization uh, to help reduce this cyber risk. Because uh, many of these attacks uh, can be prevented by creating policies that um, direct the human behavior in your offices. Um, phishing training is great. Uh, making sure that your uh, employees and yourselves are uh, patching your systems. Uh, and we can get into what patching is a little bit later, but basically that's making sure you update your system whenever you get the notification that there is an update available. Um, and not using USBs is, is a great uh, best practice, but I know that there's sometimes that uh, there's no way around that. Um, but at the end of the day, most of these cyber attacks uh, use malware um, and the intent, the target and the impact may be different, but many of the techniques are the same. Um, so CRI's program, uh, we have a totally free program that has uh, a lot of great resources. Um, but as I mentioned before, we focus on human behavior um, and the four main pillars of our program are authentication, which is essentially passwords, patching, which is software updates, phishing, which if you are patching and not clicking on bad links, ransomware should not be an issue, <laughs> um, and USB use. Um, within our program, we have an incident response and resilience uh, template which is pretty great. Um, and it's nice to have a place that you can go and help develop your internal policies. Um, and then we also have a lot of guidance and tools on preventative measures and really creating that incident response plan. Um, and you can go to our website there um, and check out our resources. It's again, all free and uh, intended for small and medium sized businesses. And I'll turn this over to Shazad to kind of go over uh, Global Cyber Alliance's uh, offerings. Yeah, so <clears throat> just really quickly, um, in terms of what GCA does, like I mentioned already that we do various uh, areas in cybersecurity and kind of find those gaps and some of the things that, uh, you know, people need to really start focusing on. Um, and one area that we've noticed was that with small businesses, is that there's all these guidelines and regulations that are out there that either governments are doing or various organizations are providing. But the problem ends up being is, is that small businesses don't have a technical team that may, you know, are, are, are basically unable to understand what those types of things mean. You know, what are those guidelines? What do those regulations mean? And what are the tools specifically that you that you need to have in place in order to meet those regulations or those those uh, standards that are out there. So Global Cyber Alliance developed the Small Business Toolkit, which it's, it, which will help actually address those issues and, you know, and help you define, okay, these are the specific tools that are needed and necessary in order to uh, meet, meet those standards or meet those regulations, right? And a lot of the things that we're going to be talking about these over these next few weeks, you know, we provide those tools to help you uh, fill in and get those get that type of information that you need. Put in these this specific tool, and you'll fill that particular gap or fill that particular regulation that is out there. So we have our GCA Cybersecurity Toolkit. Um, I don't have the link up there, but this website is gcatoolkit.org, and that's where you can go to view that. Um, and I'm sure towards the end of, of our presentations, we'll give you these links as well. And then we're going to move on to know what you have. So um, it's very important to know exactly and specifically what you have within your organization. Because it's going to be very, it's going to obviously play a very key role. And the thing is, is that if you don't know what you have, 
how are you supposed to protect it? You know, how do you know what are the protection mechanisms that you need? What is it specifically that you need to secure? Right. So you need to know what is in your IT environment. What number of computers do you have? Do you have laptops? Right. Do you have people working remotely with and what are they using in terms of, of their work capabilities? And what specifically is on your network? Right. Do you have printers? You know, who has access to those printers? You know, do you, and really anything that you have, does that, you know, what connects to the internet? What does not connect to the internet? Shehzad, sorry for interruption. I have a question before you move to the next topic. Uh, do printers and scanners pose some kind of risk? Thank you. Yeah, actually they do. Um, printers and scanners do, uh, which is because a lot of people end up doing is they leave administrative control to the printers through the internet. And what that can cause is that one, people can start printing and they can print whatever they want and random things through those printers. Um, in some cases, if those printers have vulnerabilities, right? If they have vulnerabilities, they can actually take advantage of those systems and from that printer, go on to another system. So you'd be surprised in the types of little things, you know, that are out there that are internet accessible. And that's why it's important to know what are your internet connected devices, right? Even IOT type devices, right? Internet of things. Those are things that can be used to, if they're vulnerable to, and susceptible to different types of attacks, they can leverage those types of systems to go and get to other types of systems. Right, and IoT people, a lot of you know, people think of things like you know, Google Home and your Amazon Echo and other smart devices. <clears throat> but remember, things like your um, your heating and and uh, air conditioning types of units, some of those are connected to the internet. Right, they have these new technologies that they connect these to the, the to various things to control them, and people have leverage and have taken advantage of those types of vulnerabilities to do phishing type of attacks or get access to that to leverage other types of information to access other vulnerable machines. Right, so that's why it's important to know about anything that's internet accessible within your environment, especially at work. You know, what are some of the old devices? Right, are you still running things like Windows XP? Right, because Windows XP, those aren't, that's a vulnerable system that's no longer patched or updated. So what are the things that you know, people can take advantage of that? Your CCTV, your CCTV, right? Do you have the default passwords on there and haven't changed them? You know, is there an online account that you're being that you don't use anymore? But there's a lot of data that's on there and you just forgot about it, right? And do you have any outdated software that you no longer use and needs that needs to be removed, right? So attackers are going to take advantage of the various types of things that are out there, and especially you know with printers. You know, again, printers and scanners. Most people don't think to put their or update the admin password. They leave it the way it is, or they're not even aware that there is an admin password on the machine. So they just plug it in, let it go, and there you go. So you have to take into account, okay, you do still need to protect that for those particular types of systems because they can be used and leveraged. So know what your assets are in your environment. Really, I mean, take into account everything. You know, desktops, laptops, smartphones, tablets, you know, point of sale systems, right? Do you have like a register that you use? You know, all those types of things. Don't take it, you know, don't take any, anything that's internet accessible or has some level of internet access, record that. You know, know what applications you're running, right? Because those are the applications you need to make sure that you're updating on a consistent basis, right? If you're not from, you're aware that this one exists, you may never get updated again. Right, so know about what applications are running on which system. So your Office, Adobe, and so on. And be aware of what are your online accounts. You know, do because those are going to be important to know because you know things that we're going to talk about later. Do they have strong passwords? Right, what kind of information is being stored on those accounts? Right, so like email and banking and credit card accounts, those are going to probably be the more critical ones. The Amazon on Netflix, maybe not so much. Right, the Amazon, if you have an Amazon business account, that's going to be important because, right, because people are going to be able to purchase things, especially if you save your credit card on the Amazon site. But the other things that you need to know, especially when it comes to these different types of assets that you have, is who has access to these systems, 
and who actually needs access to that, that system, right? So the question you need to ask yourself is, what is the minimal level of access required for each system or application to function effectively, right? Does your everyday user have to have full admin credentials on that particular system in order to do their job, right? Most likely, no, they will not. I mean, unless you're an IT administrator, then yes, you, you need that in order to your job. But if it's somebody who's just, you know, an admin assistant or, you know, a secretary, they mean, they're not going to need admin access. Why give them administrative level access on that machine? You put, you, they just need user level access. So the best thing to do is always give restrictive access to people in your environment and then eventually work their way up, right? Because if everyone in your environment had administrative access and they did something wrong, right? Or they have access to something that they shouldn't have access to, then they get all this information and either they can take it and sell it. Um, you know, if they open up a phishing email now that their entire system is infected, which then can lead to other uh, machines being infected, um, you know, right? If they download something they shouldn't have downloaded or install something that they shouldn't have installed, you know, that could create issues. But you also don't look at it in terms of just the, the system itself, right? The desktop or the laptop, where, which servers on your network do they have access to, right? Do they need access to every single printer in your, in your office? Right, they just need access to specific printers, right? You know, if they're on the first floor and there's a printer right next to them, why do they need to go to the fifth floor to print something? And then third-party access, right? Business partners or other people, consultants, you know, students that have access into your environment. What level of access do they have? Do they really need to have that level of access, right? You know, if you're sharing a drive with them, make sure they're only accessing that shared drive. You know, make sure they're not in accessing your entire corporate drive, right? Just so make sure there's restrictive access to what you need. So it's best to restrict them as best as possible and then just give them permissions as needed and as permissions are, uh, as requested. So again, knowing what you have is going to be important. So if you're not right now in your case, in your situation and in your environment, you're not aware of what you have right now, then you should really go and create that inventory, right? Get an inventory of all your devices, all the software that's being used, all the accounts that are in your environment, right? See what's there, see what's going on, see what the status is of each of those systems. You know, how old is that one particular device? Does the device, should the device be updated? You know, is your software up to date? You know, if you're running, you know, Windows XP, can you take that machine and make sure that you're running Windows 10 or what, you know, the latest one, right? So, and then also see who has access to your, your uh, environment too. So, and keep note of that. You know, you may not need to know every single folder, every single file that they have access to, but at least know that these are the people who are outside of your environment who do not work for you that have access to your environment. But the important thing is, is it's not just a one-time thing, right? You need to keep this up to date. You purchase a new laptop, add it to the list, right? So that way you're adding things to the list as you need and as you're going through. And so, yes, a good point that somebody put in the chat there. So yes, reducing the access without limiting ability to work proactively is key issue at the beginning, yes. Excellent statement. Thank you for that, Katya. Um, so here's just a sample of an inventory. You don't have to necessarily go into this much detail. Um, this is actually something you can download from our from the GCA toolkit. We have this available uh, for free to download. Um, but at least you need to know things like your asset name, what type of device it is. You know, know the model number and the manufacturer because sometimes when you have to call somebody up. Um, or call someone to help you, you they, they would ask you that kind of information. What is the model number on that system? What's the serial number on that system, right? Because then they get to look it up to see, okay, are you still under a warranty? You know, if like for, um, if it's an Apple laptop, they're going to check to see, do you have Apple care on that? So that way you don't get charged for it. You know, those are things that are going to be important. You know, everything else in terms of physical location, purchase date, warranty information. If you have that information, that's great. 
right? But you don't have necessarily have to fill out every single column that you see here, right? At most, I would say asset name, the type of device, the description of it, the model, the manufacturer. And if you have internal tags or IDs, put those in, in there as well. So again, just as a reminder, if you do have any questions, feel free to put those questions in the chat window. We will have time towards the end here to, uh, to answer any questions as well. And at this point, I will pass it on to Leslie for Beyond Simple Passwords. Thanks for that. Uh, so we are going to discuss uh, passwords and the importance of those. Uh, if we wanna go to the next slide, that would be great. Uh, so one of the most common methods criminals will use to gain access to your account and network uh, is to log in as you. Uh, so that means they have gotten access to your password uh, and your username, which is most likely your email, and if not your email, some form of your name. Uh, so it is extremely important to have a unique password for each one of your accounts. Um, and that not only applies to your personal versus your business accounts, but every single one of your business accounts should have a unique password. Um, computing power has increased over time while size and cost have decreased. A smartphone from 2012 has nearly three times the processing power of a supercomputer from 1985. Uh, so basically an inexpensive laptop in today's world and a decent program can crack a password extremely fast. Uh, so that not only means that uh, you need to have unique passwords, uh, but keep them long and complex. And we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. Uh, so there are a couple of ways that passwords can be cracked. Um, brute force attack, which is using that computer power to assemble a number of possible combinations for passwords, uh, which is why it is extremely important to have at least a 12 character password. Um, another form of password cracking is a dictionary attack. Uh, so let's say you are from Tbilisi um, and you love the rugby team here uh, and you have your favorite player, uh, this hacker knows that you are from Tbilisi and from your social media, he knows that you are a fan of this rugby player. Uh, so chances are your password might have this rugby player's name in it. So the, the intelligent hacker is going to put in things that he knows about you and then that will direct the computer to then try a bunch of different uh, forms of that password to try to get into your account. Uh, another form is credential stuffing. Uh, so once your account, uh, let's say you use the same password for your Netflix and your Hulu and your Gmail. Um, a lot of those companies are hacked on a pretty regular basis. Um, so chances are one of your passwords, even if it's something you use 10, 15 years ago, that password is likely out on the internet somewhere associated with your email. Uh, so once um, a hacker has that password and your email, he's going to go around and try that with every account that he knows that you might have. Uh, so let's say uh, you use the same password accidentally for Netflix that you used for your banking. Uh, he's going to go to either TBC or Bank of Georgia, go online, use your name or your email, whatever password you need, and then try the account or the passwords that he's found online to try to get access to your banking account. Uh, so that's very common. And that's why it's extremely important that, especially if you know that a, an account of yours has been compromised, you make sure you change your password. Uh, and then secondarily, unique passwords are extremely important. Uh, another, example of how passwords can be cracked uh, are phishing emails. Uh, so you've all gotten emails, I'm sure, from uh, your bank or from Facebook or from Gmail suggesting that it is time to reset your password. 
um, make sure you just double check that email to make sure it's coming from a legitimate source. Um, better yet, go directly to the site, whether it's your banking site, your Facebook site, your email site, rather than clicking on the link in the email, just go directly to the site and reset your password there if you uh, receive one of these emails. It's better than accidentally clicking on um, an attachment that is malicious or a link that is malicious. Um, so as I mentioned before, social engineering uh, is a way to gain access to your passwords. Um, people know a lot about you. Um, they are able to learn from your social media and then trick you into giving them information. Uh, manual guessing is another uh, potential way that passwords can be cracked. Uh, kind of like I mentioned before, so kind of along the lines of social engineering, uh, but there's a lot of information about you online. Uh, so try to use the passwords and passphrases that are um, unique and not easily guessable. Shoulder surfing, somewhat unlikely, um, but uh, there's always a chance that if you are working in a public place, someone could glance over your shoulder and see your passwords uh, being typed into your computer. Uh, along the same lines, if you are on a public network, uh, there are ways to set up uh, Wi-Fi networks that look like other Wi-Fi networks and people are able to intercept your passwords and see what you're typing into your computer. Uh, so in that sense, uh, just use a VPN if you have to be on public Wi-Fi, uh, but at the end of the day, if you can avoid being on public Wi-Fi, that is ideal. Um, and I'm just going to hop into the chat real quick because I saw Katya put a question. Um, if the hacker is not my relative or close friend, how is it possible that the hacker knows which bank account you are using or Gmail username? How high of a chance is that? Uh, so Katya, that's a great question. Uh, in general, uh, people, I guess a hacker would not necessarily know that you are using TBC or Bank of Georgia, but from your social media or your LinkedIn, people are going to know where you live in the general, um, the general places and stores that people go. Um, so they might not know for sure that you have a Bank of Georgia account, but they would potentially know that you might have one there or a TBC account. Um, and your email, more or less, if you went and searched yourself on the internet, your email will probably come up somewhere, whether it's your personal email or your work email. Uh, it's just not that difficult to find and hackers are pretty good at finding that information. Does that help answer your question? Thank you, uh, Lissy. Absolutely. Thank okay. you very much. No problem. Uh, so uh, creating a strong password. Uh, it doesn't just have to be a password. Uh, it can be a passphrase. Um, so To Kill a Mockingbird, I absolutely love this example. Uh, maybe To Kill a Mockingbird is your favorite book and you are not actively posting about your favorite book online. Um, there are multiple different ways that you can turn To Kill a Mockingbird into a very complex password uh, by using different characters to make up that easily memorable statement. Uh, so you can see the O turns into a zero and the um, one of the L's is an exclamation point. Um, it's just, there's a lot of different ways that you can do this um, and just Remembering the unique password you use is really important. Try not to put them on a post-it note on your computer, because that is not ideal. If uh, you're worried about shoulder surfing or anything like that, uh, that is one way to ensure that your password would get stolen. Um, so try to keep them in a private place. Um, using password uh, keepers and monitors, or, or like a uh, key pass or something along those lines, uh, is not a bad idea, uh, but you always run the risk of those potentially being hacked. So determine what your risk level is and what your risk tolerance is for where you decide to store your passwords. 
Um, again, try to avoid any personal identifiable information uh, such as pet names, favorite sports teams, uh, your favorite place to go on the weekend because you most likely have posted about that on social media. Uh, don't use your birthday or anniversary date. Um, so try to um, keep that uh, unique. Um, and then general rule of thumb is minimum of 15 characters. Um, and depending on the systems that you use, um, they may need to be less than that or slightly more than that. Uh, it just really depends. Uh, and it looks like we have another question in here. Um, so general passwords, hate to change passwords. Okay, so your question is that there's a practice among big companies to suggest automatic password, passwords which are stored in their systems. Uh, do I think that way is more secure? Nino, are you referring to uh, yes. storing passwords like on Google or something along those lines? Uh, yes, exactly. Okay. I mean, this that some systems suggest such as stored passwords and it seems to me that it's more secure and it's more reliable because they have much more uh, stable and prominent uh, secure systems and what do you think about it? Uh, maybe if uh, all, uh, not only the high company, but mm -hmm. more companies use this practice, this will be more convenient for users. Yeah. So I personally like the, the Google and Firefox suggestions for passwords. Um, and I personally will use that. Um, but I also try to keep a unique password for each one of my accounts. Uh, so, and um, for certain accounts, I don't use that. So I just, it all depends on uh, what your risk tolerance is. Shazad, I'll let you jump in here about uh, uh, your thoughts on this, but I, I don't personally see an issue with it. Uh, mm. I think that they're they're long and complex and, and hard to hack. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. I mean, I agree. I mean, it depends, right? So, you know, password managers, as they call them now, you know, those are those are really those are great. They're very popular. A lot of people use them, you know, like LastPass, Dashlane, and so on. Um, and they, you know, one nice thing is is a lot of them generate the passwords for you. Um, you know, they, you know, they generate long passwords that you won't even remember. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it, it's something that can work. It's something that that does. Or just you know, just realize that right. You know, there's another application. You have to make sure it stays up to date. But then also make sure you still have to have that one strong password, though, right? Because if someone guesses that password, then now they have everything that they have access to everything. So um, you still, you know, even if you use these password managers, which is it, which is a good thing. It's not a bad thing to use those. It is a good thing to use. So just make sure you have that one strong password to protect all those other passwords. <laughs> okay, thank you for your answer. Great. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, many of your emails and passwords are likely already out there uh, for the world to see. Uh, you can go and check your, your email and to see if they have been breached at any point, even your old email address that you used when you were 12 years old, uh, there's a chance that it was hacked at some point uh, and your password might be out there with it. Uh, so you can go to this site, haveibeenpwned.com and check to see uh, which ones of your accounts have been compromised. Um, so one thing that I highly encourage, um, GCA and CRI both uh, fully support two-factor authentication. Uh, this kind of, you know, and Katya, to your point, um, this kind of just adds a level of protection. Uh, so if somebody did happen to gain access to one of your passwords, or if one of your accounts was compromised, you will likely get a text or uh, require an additional level of verification um, if you have two-factor authentication in place. And this will just add another layer of protection. Um, 
Most of you know what this is, your phones, most of your emails, almost all of your bank accounts will require some sort of two-factor authentication. Um, and it can either be uh, a text sent to your phone, a uh, verification uh, email sent to your email, which I generally try to stay away from those because likely if someone has access to your account, they also have access to your email. Um, uh, a token, so using Google Authenticator or Microsoft Authenticator, there's a few others that are out there. Um, and iPhones and a lot of Androids now have fingerprint or face biometrics um, for two-factor authentication. So it just really adds a huge layer of defense um, and just adds an extra level of protection if someone gains access to your password. Um, so some more hands-on activity and homework uh, before next time. Uh, try to install an authenticator app on your phone if you don't already have one. Uh, ensure that you have two-factor authentication for both your email and social media accounts, including your company email and social media accounts. That's extremely important. And most of the time, uh, two-factor two authentication is available, but you might have to do a little bit of digging in the settings to make sure you're able to um, activate it. Um, so just check your other email accounts uh, that uh, you might have been using before or you're currently using to see if they've been compromised. Um, and if they have, even if they haven't, if you haven't changed your password in a while, it might be a good idea to do that. Um, and then make sure all of your passwords in are, are unique for each one of your different accounts. Um, enable two-factor authentication for all of your accounts where it's a, uh, supported, uh, and then check your remotely accessible devices for any admin and admin default settings. Uh, so try to change those passwords like your Wi-Fi router and things like that um, for default passwords. Make sure they also have a unique password. And I can turn this over to you all uh, to see if you have any more questions. Uh, and then uh, if Shazad, you have any other comments before we wrap up? Actually, just to give an example to folks about the two-factor authentication, um, just real world example, and this is what happened to me. <laughs> um, so, I mean, like some, some things like Facebook, right? So Facebook does, um, they allow for, they basically, when you enable two-factor authentication, you get text messages um, saying that, you know, your here's your token, here's your unique token. So there was one day, you know, just sitting at home, you know, you know, watching TV or something like that. And then all of a sudden I'm getting text messages on my phone saying, here's your Facebook ID. Or here, sorry, here's your Facebook token token for you to put into place. I must have gotten like 10 of those messages. <laughs> so what happened at that point was basically that face, you know, somebody had actually figured out my Facebook password and now they're getting the token, <laughs> but they can't get the token because the token comes to my phone. So that should be like a key indicator, right? So my password was actually I had to be bad. <laughs> so I had to go back, reset my password. So that way, one, they don't guess the password anymore. But at least I, if I had, since I had the two-factor authentication enabled on that, it protected my account. It prevented the person from fully getting completely into my account. Yeah, they figured out the password, but that wasn't a big deal. They they didn't have the token. But then, of course, I also make sure that you know, did I use that same password anywhere else? Um, so you know, went back and it really ended up it gave me a good indicator of you know what it's time to reset all of my passwords across the board. Um, so that's something you do have to really consider. And when those, those that's why two-factor important is very, very important um, because that adds that layer of protection. It gives you that layer of protection. Even if they get, were able to get your password, getting that token is much more difficult to do, um, you know, than, you know, you know, just get your password and now they're in and they're able to do whatever they want. Now, I'll just add to that a little bit. Um, with a lot of your emails, especially Gmail, uh, it will also allow you to track the number of devices that you have logged in on your account. Uh, and that's really helpful uh, just so you know where your account has been logged in, whether you're using a VPN or not. Um, if there's a login popping up in, uh, I don't know, 
North Dakota and you've never been in North Dakota in your life, uh, then likely someone is in your email that should not be there. Um, so that's just another thing to pay attention to. All right. Um, if nobody has any additional questions, uh, we can wrap up this session and we will see you all next week on Wednesday at the same time. Uh, here's some additional resources. Um, I can have Katya send around uh, this PowerPoint if you guys uh, would find that helpful, uh, just so you have access to the links as well as the uh, homework assignment. Thank you, Lacey, a lot. No problem. All right, thank you all, and looking forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you, Lacey. Thank you, Shazad, for your effort. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. See you next week and two days prior to the event on February 17th. That will be the session, too. I will send you a Zoom link. Lacey and Shazad, that was a brilliant lesson for me personally, because this is I'm always struggling against. Thank you very much. It was interesting. So I guess you will share the PowerPoint because I missed some information when I was on a call just two minutes. <laughs> I'd like to have it. Thank you very much. No problem. Um, and if Thank there's you. any feedback you guys have um, or things that you'd like us to cover that's specific to uh, Georgia, just uh, send Katya or myself or Shazad a note and we try to incorporate that into the next one. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Lacey and Shazad. Lacey, if you, if you send me this presentation, I will uh, submit and circulate this within the participants. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks.